Okay, we'll get started. Uh, thank you everyone for joining this uh, OECD UNEP Global PFC Group uh, webinar on uh, advances in understanding of PFAS substances. So uh, today we have two speakers with us. Uh, so uh, Dr. Zanyin Wang from EMPA Zurich, I will uh, talk about the outcomes and outputs of the uh, Global PFC Group's synthesis report on understanding sidechain fluorinated polymers and their life cycle. And then we'll have Dr. Takeshi uh, Hasegawa from Kyoto University, who will speak about uh, research uh, that uh, he has undertaken on the strat stratified dipole, dipole arrays and the strat stratified dipole array theory as a way to understand uh, PFAS behavior. So I'd uh, encourage you uh, during the presentations, if you have questions, to put um, those questions in the Q&A box. So instead of using the chat, use the question and answer function that's in the Zoom. Um, and uh, after the two presentations, we'll take up some of those questions. And uh, just to let you know that the recording, uh, the presentation is also being recorded uh, to post on the, the uh, OECD PFAS portal afterwards. So uh, with that, I think we have a lot of content to go through today. So um, I'll turn it over to Zanyun for the first presentation. Thank you. Sorry, Zanyun, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Eva, for the introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. So I will just, uh, well, yeah just presents our the synthesis report. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very rich report. So I will try to think to, uh, kind of just present some of the key learnings today. Um, first started with like why we have uh, like started this report at the first place. Uh, as many of you know that PFAS can be divided into non-polymers and polymers. So the kind of two distinct groups and attention has fo primarily focused on the non-polymeric PFAS so far. Uh, and it is uh, recognized that it is equally important to understand the polymeric ones as well, uh, including sectin fluorinated polymers, fluoropolymers, and perfluoropolyesis. So this is report is kind of the first of the series focusing on the sectin fluorinated polymers which are defined as polymers with a non-fluorinated polymer backbone uh, and with PFAS moieties on the side chains. So the reports uh, consists of seven uh, chapters, uh, apart from the introduction chapter, uh, there are like six uh, substantive chapters. Chapter two talks about the identities of side chain fluorinated polymers on the global market. Chapter three to six talks about talk about the life cycle of various types of side chain fluorinated polymers. In the report, we touched upon uh, the production and use, the presence of other uh, PFAS in the commercial formulations, the degradation of side chain fluorinated polymers, uh, the environment release of side chain fluorinated polymers and other PFASs. Uh, and there are also some summary of the critical data and knowledge gaps and options for a way forward. Uh, the chapter seven is conclusion, and I would also like to highlight that there is also an annex containing of uh, containing five spreadsheets on more the detailed background knowledge on the sidechain fluorinated polymers. Um, so first, I would just talk a bit about the, the sidechain fluorinated polymers on the market. In this study, we identified a non-exhaustive list of 103 sidechain fluorinated polymers uh, and 42 associated PFAS monomers. Uh, and they can be grouped uh, based on the structure in different ways. Um, uh, and in most cases, we could identify the chem a generic chemical structures to group them. Uh, for example, that uh, there are uh, like the, a lot of the uh, are the acrylate uh, chain fluorinated polymers, um, like with a particularly this uh, repeating uh, structure unit. Uh, and also here we'll also like to highlight sometimes we can have the floral telomer based moieties on side chains. So this will be uh, considered to, to an 
uh, the fluorotelomer alkylates uh, citrine fluorinated polymers. Uh, and then we can also have a fluorotelomer based uh, uracine uh, citrine fluorinated polymers with a kind of a uracine uh, linkages here uh, as like it on the side chains. Uh, and they're, they're also different as a different types of like uh, different moieties, for example, like the PACF based. So these are derived from the perfluoroalkanoid um, uh, fluoride, PACF, or de derived from uh, perfluoroalkane sulfonyl fluoride, uh, PASF based moieties, or, or like also with the perfluoropolyether based moieties with uh, like ether linkages on the PFAS moieties on side chains. Uh, and then we okay, there are also different uh, other different repeating units, uh, such as the oxetane, uh, such as fluorinated polymers, etoxylate, and silicones. So the, the next, I will give more details about the acrylate and uracine such as fluorinated polymers because we know them the best. Uh, and to kind of guide through how, how the reports summarize the current knowledge and uh, give some light touch upon the other types of the oxytane, uh, etoxylate, and silicon polymers. Uh, and before going to the details of individual types of cytochrome fluorinated polymers, I will also, also like to highlight uh, in some cases or in kind of limited cases, we have also additional structure info details available. For example, these are the reported, uh, two studies reported these additional structure details. Uh, one is about acrylate polymers, one is, uh, the other is about the uracine polymers. I uh, can see that they have very different molecular weights. Uh, one is about 40,000 Daltons and the other one is about 3,500 Daltons. So they're very different molecular size. Uh, and there's also other information in terms of the fluorine content, uh, such as fluorinated polymer contents in the formulation. But these are very, uh, only we have this in very little limited cases. Uh, and this also said, just want to highlight that other chemical identities, uh, including the molecular weight and the PFAS moiety contents can vary considerably across across different types of citrine fluorinated polymers uh, and across different citrine fluorinated polymers within the same type. Um, yeah, and this will have implications on their different uh, like uh, environment fate and behavior. Uh, and we also notice that in multiple cases, we cannot identify the general a chemical structure or associate monomers because of uh, like due to confidential business information. This have been also quite some cases. Uh, and we also notice that there are also general kind of ambiguity in how we reject chemicals. For example, in some cases, only the trade name will assign to the cast name, uh, cast numbers. So these are the two examples. One only shows that it's a scorch guard. Uh, with the trade name and just telling you that it's a fluorine containing water repellent. And the other one is kind of a sh just showing it's a floral silane. Uh, but only from the kind of the trade name and how they will describe the, this, the product, we kind of know it, it, they are the side chain fluorinated polymers, but we don't know how what they actually, the chemical st structure would uh, look like. Uh, and then we also have cases, the assigned cast names, like it's not a trade name, but it has it's a chemical name, but it is very ambiguous. So here's one example, like it's one particularly highlight this part, uh, saying that it is reduced, uh, made to ester or of reduced polymerized oxidized tetrafluoroethylene, and it does not tell us like it tells us the starting material to produce it, but and some of the production uh, synthesize reaction types, but it, it doesn't really tell us more than that. So we also don't know what it is, what are the chemical structure behind such names. 
Uh, and what we would like to highlight that with this ambiguity, so the same cast numbers and the cast name can be used for different citing fluorinated polymers with the same generic chemical structure, but with different uh, structural details, such as molecular weight ranges and distribution. So we, we do need to do better to understand uh, what are exactly exact side chain fluorinated polymers have been used on the global market. Uh, then I will go to the kind of the first type group of side chain fluorinated polymers. Again, I like just showing the structure quickly. I'm going to talk about the acrylate side chain fluorinated polymers and the uracine ones. Um, and this side chain flow polymers will like will produce really largely uh, in the past, like in in two thousand, up to about fifty percent of the uh, perfluoroctosulfonyl fluoride were used to uh, produce acrylate and uracine side chain fluorinate polymers, and this is much higher than uh, many of the non fluorinate uh, non polymeric PFAS, for example, uh, in the same year, about like 3% of the POSF was used to produce firefighting foams. Uh, and also similarly for the, in 2006, it was reported uh, that like uh, uh, about 80% of the uh, fluorotelomers manufacturer were used to make side chain fluorinate polymers. Uh, but here is the uh, we don't know, like it includes all kinds of side chain fluorinated polymers, not just acrylate and uracine. Uh, these days, there has been a shift to shorter chain PFAS. So we have seen that they have like a PBSF or the butane sulfonyl fluoride based or 6 to 2 fluorotelma based uh, side chain fluorinated polymers. But it is very uh, limited information. It's available on the volumes, although we do notice uh, some uh, they are still likely to be very significant. And I would also like to highlight while there has been this shift to shorter chain uh, PFAS, uh, but there's still some long chain, like even POSF based uh, side chain fluorinated polymers were still used in some Nordic countries at least into 2020. So there's still some ongoing uses that need to be addressed. Uh, the acrylate and uracine side chain fluorinated polymers are mainly used for surface uh, treatments for the fabric, textiles, and apparel articles, and for a full contact paper and paper boards. They're also used as, uh, used as floral surfactants, for example, we have identified some were used or have been used in firefighting foam formulations. And they also, uh, also identified a number of other application areas where they likely have been used as floral surfactants, uh, including the inks, uh, like paints, adhesives, and binding agents. Uh, and the, the report further looking to the presence of other uh, PFAS within the kind of the side chain fluorinated polymers. Uh, and so in order to understand, it will also be good to understand the general synthesized routes. So for example, here's one of the general synthesized routes of the fluorotelomer based uracine side chain fluorinated polymers, starting from the um, perfluoroalkyl iodides, uh, and then it goes to the fluorotelomer iodides and goes to fluorotelomer alcohols, which will be then uh, uh, getting to the uracine polymers. And then here's also a list of the chemicals that have been measured or, or PFAS have been measured in the uh, commercial formulations of um, uracine section fluorinated polymers. And we can see that. Uh, we, we do see that unreacted residue of the starting materials are PFOI, uh, and also the impurities in the starting materials, like the PFOA, um, as an impurity in the PFOI. Uh, and then we also see that there could also be reaction products of the different impurities. For example, there's uh, this impurity A to 8. Uh, esters, it is a, a reaction product of the A22F2OH and PFOA. Uh, and we we'll also like to highlight that these are kind of the unintentionally added substances, but they could also be intentionally left 
like impurities or residues uh, in, in the the formulations, for example, in this case, A22FTOH sometimes left as a, a kind of dispersant uh, in the formulations. Um, and the levels of crow vary across considerably across different formulations. And in some, some cases, like they're up to 5% FT, uh, A22FTOH as a dispersant uh, in the formulations reported. Very similar case for the acrylate uh, section fluorinated polymers. You have the only record uh, starting materials. So you have the impurities in the starting materials. Uh, you also have the degradation products of the different uh, non polymeric ones. Uh, currently, we have not identified any mass balance studies of the fate and distribution of these non polymeric PFAS during the application of commercial section fluorinated polymers which can be an area to be further looked into. Um, the next thing that we look into are the degradation. Uh, and there, there are generally two types of uh, pathways. One is the hydrolysis, uh, the, the esterification of the ester bond here for both acrylate and uracine polymers. And the second thing is the breakout of hydrocarbon black, uh, backbones. Uh, and currently, they have, uh, well, in the past, there have been quite some discussion about the degradation half-lives. Uh, and uh, like in 2015, there was a study by John Washington. It was noted uh, that there were a lot of the kind of like, it's a kind of tricky measurements to conduct. And they really conduct a very thorough uh, analysis uh, and rule out a lot of the different uh, like artifacts and uncertainties, and they were able to conclude that uh, the uh, degradation half life of two acrylates as uh, section fluorinated polymers was about a couple of decades. Uh, and significant release of section fluorinated polymers and other PFAS have been uh, observed, uh, like. Uh, particularly during the application and the commercial of the commercial formulations and the pressing processing of the treated materials, uh, like 3M reported, it was about like 10 to 25% in the case of fiber, textile, and leather. Uh, and also studies have shown that there are releases during both cytogen fluorine polymers and other PFAS during the use and disposal of treated articles. And they have some of the cytogen fluorine polymers our components have been measured in the different environment media. So it's the plus all the information I uh, demonstrated before uh, showing that they can act as or are acting as long-chain sources, long-term sources of perfluoroalkyl acids in the environment. Uh, then quickly go through some other types of the sidechain fluorinated polymers. For example, one is this the oxytine cytogen fluorinated polymers. Uh, we know very little about their production in the uh, like uh, in the public domain. Uh, they are mainly used as uh, fluoros surfactants, as a wetting of low and leveling agents. Uh, in some cases, they can also be used as a reactive intermediates. Uh, the presence of other PFAS is, is very uh, little is known. Uh, but at least the uh, unreacted raw materials and intermediates, uh, as well as reaction byproducts have been reported in some cases. Uh, the degradability is, uh, there's, we have not identified any studies, uh, and it is a little bit hard to predict because on one side, uh, they have an ether bond on the same chain instead of the ether bond, which is a little bit more difficult to break. Uh, uh, but on the other side, that the, uh, the oxidating cytogen fluorinate polymers generally have lower average molecular weight, is about 1,500 daltons, therefore have much higher bioavailability uh, to, for the degradation. Uh, and we have not identified any environment releases studies, but it is likely uh, this also occurring. Oh, uh, and then we go to the silicon sidechain fluorinated silicon polymers. Uh, there's very limited data uh, publicly available on the, their production, but it is likely to be very significant 
as well. Here's one example of uh, like a CF3 based citrine fluorinated uh, kind of the monomer. The monomer was first reacted to produce uh, D3F, the siloxane. Uh, and the, also having some the the side, side reaction to produce the D4F uh, and then to produce this CF3 based citrine fluorinated polymers. Uh, and it is reported in 2016, this type of citrine fluorinated polymers were produced globally at uh, about 44,000 tons. So, uh, yeah, so it is significant. Um, and they have a lot of, lot of different uses, surface protection, medical applications, and you can find all the details in the report. So I'm not going to repeat uh, them here. Uh, also in these cases, little is known about the presence of other PFAS but at least unreacted raw materials and intermediates, as well as the reaction byproducts have been uh, measured in some cases. And there have been also more studies about the degradability. For example, they have the poor thermal stability, uh, they can degrade under the UV light, and they can be oxidized via, for example, top assays. And in such cases, uh, you can observe that the, the polymers will, will be converted back to the siloxanes, then further the, the uh, kind of degrade into the silanes, and then you can have the break and produce the perfluoroalkyl acids at the end. So, uh, and we have already measured eleven elevated uh, this uh, the siloxanes are uh, in different environment media, but we have not identified the detailed uh, like the monomer or uh, the silanes or the silicon polymers in the environment. Uh, the last one goes through the the life cycle of the etoxylate citrine fluorinated polymers. The production again, there's very little is known in the public, but in some cases, I think in three cases, we could find data and they were like uh, uh, up to uh, 450 tons in the US alone. So it could be very uh, significant. Uh, they are used as a surface uh, surfactant and as all surface treatments in different industrial processing, commercial applications and consumer uses. Um, and you can find all the details in the reports. Um, they also can have quite significant unreacted raw materials and intermediates. One study reported up to 4%. Uh, and the degradability has also been measured. They are biodegradable, but potentially also very slow. I think one study like did, did 48 days and did not observe too much uh, degradation, particularly not like the chain shortening was very slow. So this might also be a further looked into. Uh, and the environmental releases have been detected in the leachate of a disposal facility in Japan. So overall, as, as I presented before, there are a lot of, uh, there's still a lot of data gaps, in particularly in terms of the production uh, and, uh, uh, and also some of these impurities inside all the environment, uh, like the degradation parts or all the, the, the detailed degradation half lives, all the environment releases. But from the existing evidence, we can already conclude that a wide range of citrine fluorinated polymers have been produced and used in many different applications, with at least some at very high or to very high volumes, up to like tens of thousands of tons per year. Uh, and many uh, non polymeric PFAS maybe presents uh, in citrine fluorinated polymers, sometimes at even like percentage levels, which can be released during the whole life cycle. Uh, yeah, and also not only this uh, associated non-polymeric PFAS may be released, but also uh, the, the citrine fluorinated polymers themselves may be released during the whole life cycle up to like in, in the case of the, like the Surya M reported like 10 to 25% are uh, just released during the treatment of textiles and also the processing of the textiles. Uh, and the grid uh, many citrine fluorinated polymers or like 
section from candidates, and they do form the non-polymeric PFAS, including different uh, perfluoroalkyl acids in the environment and biota. And therefore, that many cytochrome fluorinated polymers are acting as long-term significant sources to the global burden of non-polymeric PFAS in the environment and biota. Uh, and therefore, that concerted action is really needed to address cytochrome fluorinated polymers while filling some of these critical data gaps. Uh, so yeah, we'd like to thank again to the OECD UNEP Global PFC Group for the uh, opportunities and also for the different inputs. Um, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Zen Yun, for uh, giving us the overview of that report. There's a lot of content in the in the report, so we encourage um, participants to to go and examine the report and the annexes them, themselves. Um, but it's also yeah interesting to hear about even though there is a lot of material in the report, still a significant amount of data gaps uh, on various aspects that the the report tried to uh, collect information on. Uh, so I encourage anyone to put uh, um, questions in the Q&A box um, in the Zoom function, and we'll take them after our next speaker. So I'd like to now uh, switch uh, over to uh, Dr. Takashi Hasegawa from Kyoto University. And as I mentioned, he's going to speak about this uh, stratified dipole arrays theory and, uh, and, the, and the context for PFAS uh, with this theory. So uh, thank you, Dr. Hasegawa, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for a kind introduction and uh, I'll thank you very much for providing me uh, uh, excellent opportunity. And I'm very much excited to give a, give a talk on the SDA, scratch file dipole arrays theory, that is a specific and uh, uh, proving specific essential basis for a comprehensive understanding of material properties of PFAS. And PFAS has long been a uh, discussed in the framework of organic chemistry that is based on hydrocarbons. The biggest problem is that physical chemistry is out of scope of this framework. And as a result, um, essential uh, core of the PFAS uh, as a molecular science is missing. And unfortunately, technological uh, development and the discussion of policies are made on this inappropriate science. So the SDA theory uh, I'm talking about today is a, a real uh, recently built a new uh, fluorine specific physical chemist, uh, physical chemical uh, chemistry, and that works well for explaining details of PFAS. And SDA influences every matter of PFAS, uh, extending not only to academia but also to uh, industries and policies. And please note that the SDA theory is are totally different from the conventional hydrocarbon chemistry. So uh, this panel shows uh, that PFAS specific uh, many properties, uh, uh, um, probably uh, the most famous one is the uh, water on oil repellency. Um, but uh, uh, on looking at this panel, uh, what do you th uh, think of the uh, correlation between the uh, material properties? For example, if you readily explain the uh, water on oil repellency, uh, can you explain the uh, low electric permittivity in the same manner? Probably no. This is the uh, um, uh, theoretical limit uh, by using the uh, hydrocarbon chemistry, hydrocarbon-based chemistry, and SDA theory break, breaks this limit. Okay, so the uh, ma material properties are generally appeared through the uh, molecular aggregation in other words, material properties are not uh, directly correlated with the uh, molecular primary chemical structure, and it needs the molecular aggregation. But in the hydrocarbon case, this aggregation uh, step can conveniently be skipped because uh, each chemical group uh, can roughly be attributed to hydrophobic or hydrophilic. In the case of octanoic acid, for example, the uh, hydrophilic part uh, is, uh, is lost uh, because of uh, the formation of ring dimer uh, with a neighboring molecule. And as a result, hydrophobic part dominates the material property, uh, even for a single molecule. So that is why this molecule uh, is insoluble in water, but soluble in oil. 
But in the case of PFAS, uh, the situation greatly changes because the PFAS molecules are strongly aggregated with each other because of the dipole moments of, uh, along the CF bond and the helical structure about the molecular axis. Uh, that will be showing you uh, in detail. But the point is that uh, the single molecule a uh, single molecular character is totally different from the material properties of the molecular aggregation. So that's why in the case of PFAS, the molecular aggregation is definitely necessary. And this is theorized by the SDA theory. So I'm talking about the SDA theory a little bit in detail. Well, uh, for uh, uh, according to Fritz London, uh, the Van der Waals forces uh, comprises three different physical principles. And for discussing the uh, molecular interaction uh, of uh, identical compounds, uh, the second, second point uh, can be uh, uh, disregarded as, as, as stated by Fritz London. So uh, we have now two options, dispersion and orientation effects. And the orientation effects was found by the Fritz Lohner himself. And this is for the interaction between the two uh, particles having no permanent dipole moment. And this works pretty well for uh, discussing the hydrocarbon. And the point is that this dispersion, uh, uh, dispersion effect is a function of uh, molecular polarizability alpha. And uh, uh, fluorine is known to have a small uh, alpha as shown later. So for discussing the uh, PFAS, PFAS interaction, uh, the orientation effect must be taken into account. But unfortunately, this has been, this had long been missed thus far. And this orientation effect is a function of the uh, dipole moment and the uh, orientation angle between the two dipole moments, theta. So uh, now I'm showing you in this slide uh, that fluorine has a weak dispersion effect. Well, uh, these very famous pictures uh, for uh, halogen molecules at ambient temperature, uh, fluorine and chlorine are gas, uh, bromine is liquid, and iodine is solid. But please note that halogen molecules are dumbbell-shaped homonuclear diatomic molecule having no prominent dipole moment about the molecule. Nevertheless, they are associated with each other to generate the liquid and solid. This is due to the dispersion effect. And this dispersion effect is a function of alpha. And alpha depends on the flexibility of electron cloud about the molecule. And the flexibility uh, becomes larger for a larger atom. So that is why alpha becomes larger on going down the periodic table. In other words, fluorine has a very small uh, alpha in the periodic table because it's located at top in the table. So F has a weak dispersion effect. Okay, so the next point is that the fluorine, uh, the, the proper alkyl groups are interacted with each other by the dipole-dipole interaction. So this equation is the uh, 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 found, uh, theorized by uh, Fritz London um, for uh, van der Waals forces. And he calculated, for example, uh, the interaction of, of two carbon monoxide molecules by using this, uh, some par parameters to, uh, to generate these uh, uh, figures. And you find that the most of the interaction is too much oriented to the dispersion effect, and the orientation effect can be ignored. So in the same manner, I calculated uh, uh, molecular interactions uh, between the two CH fragments as a model compound for uh, hydro, hydrocarbon uh, interactions. And the calculated results are presented over here. And you find that uh, about 90% goes to the dispersion effect and orientation effect is very small. Uh, so, which means that the uh, hydrocarbon uh, interaction are dominated by the dispersion effect. That matches our uh, common sense of, for hydrocarbon. So the next, the same thing, same calculations was performed for the CH fragments, but you see that the results are overturned. In, in for the case of uh, for the molecular interaction between the uh, two CF fragments, um, the orientation effects uh, is the dominant factor. This is because the uh, uh, dipole moment of CF is 
3.5 times larger than that of CH. But the point is that orientation effect is a function of dipole moment to the fourth power to the fourth power. So 3.5 to the fourth power is about 150. So that is why the uh, relationship is overturned. So uh, for the uh, discussion of the uh, profile alkyl uh, chain interactions, uh, we have to take into account the uh, uh, orientation effect dominantly. And the last point is the uh, uh, helical structure about the uh, profile alkyl molecule. For example, when we look at the uh, uh, profile alkyl chain having uh, CF29, then the twisting angle becomes 120 degree like this. And uh, uh, to make the uh, model simpler, uh, the CF2 group is represented by only one arrow like this, and only two, uh, uh, both ends of the C, uh, CF2 are remained in the figure, and uh, the, the intermediate CF2 are omitted from the figure. So when, finally, we have a very simple uh, schematic representation of the top view of this uh, CF29 profile alkyl chain. So this 120 degree corresponds to this chain length, okay? And so, so the intermediate CF2 groups appeared here and here are uh, in blue zone, blue fan shaped zones like this. And now we are uh, arranged this uh, profile alkyl chain in the hexagonal manner. It's quite interesting to see that uh, in the hexagonal packing, uh, the uh, dipole moments, the green dipole moments are can be in lines, uh, which means that uh, the molecules are strongly uh, attracted with each other uh, in this green direction. And the same thing happens for the pink arrow directions too. So uh, the molecules are uh, aggregated spontaneously to the major matter like this. And if we add the uh, blue sh uh, fan shaped zones, uh, it, we find that this CF29 is the uh, 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 shortest length for uh, giving, giving the uh, uh, spontaneous molecular aggregation because the uh, blue fan shaped zones are, are just barely uh, connected with each other. So this is the shortest limit for the spontaneous aggregation. So what what if, uh, what happened if the uh, a little bit shorter for a uh, CF to seven? Uh, as for CF to seven, the uh, twisting angle is ninety degree. This can be spontaneously aggregated uh, by changing the uh, molecular arrangement from hexagonal to tetra tetragonal. And in the case, the molecular occupying area is a little bit larger than the hexagonal one by a factor of two over root three. That will be uh, um, experimentally confirmed as shown later. Okay, anyway, at this length, the molecules can be spontaneously aggregated. But for the shorter length, for, for example, shift to six or shorter, the blue fan shaped zone is too narrow to have the uh, two dimensional molecular aggregation. So that is why uh, the molecule, uh, single molecular character remains. Uh, th this is the very important point. For a short, short, uh, short polar chain, single molecular character appears. And uh, so there is a very big uh, criteria between the CF2 six and seven or conventionally a C7 or C8 if the terminal CF3 group is involved. So anyway, uh, C8, well, now we, uh, we are showing you that the mechanism uh, C8 is why it is so important. Another important point is that uh, for uh, lo looking at this, these molecules macroscopically, uh, the polarization P, that is a summation of the dipole moment, becomes very small because uh, the vector value uh, having different directions are summed up. So as a result, on the macroscopic scale, the dipole moment looks small, okay? So in shorter, on uh, a single molecular character has a very strong dipole moment, but on a macroscopic scale, uh, the dipole moment looks small. 
That's a very important point. So on a macros macroscopic scale, the orientation effect becomes very weak. And the molecular polarizability alpha is intrinsically small for fluorine. So that is why dispersion effect is also weak. So as a result, on the macroscopic scale, both orientation and dispersion effect are very weak. That readily accounts for water and oil repellency. And another important point is that when we uh, uh, refer to the uh, definition equation of uh, electric permittivity, the small p explains the small permittivity too. So low permittivity and water oil, water and oil repellency are coming from the same origin, small p. That is the result of the SDA theory. So now I'm sure I have shown you that uh, uh, three uh, points are readily uh, explained by using the SDA theory. And in, in our laboratory, uh, these uh, many uh, material properties are readily explained by uh, on SDA theory. And the point is that single molecular character and macroscopic molecular aggregate must strictly be discriminated. So I'm showing you some experimental results using some uh, real uh, compounds. These are compounds uh, having the uh, um, uh, myristic acid uh, backbone, having the uh, uh, some uh, tail end is uh, substituted by a profile alkyl group uh, having different lengths. And according to the SDA theory, there is a very important boundary length here. And for the shorter lengths, the molecule would act as a single molecule. And in the case, single molecule, uh, the molecule has uh, two dipole characters both at both ends. So that is why if the molecules is spread on the water surface, pr probably they are the molecules would lie on the water surface. But for the longer uh, profile acute chains, the molecules are expected to give, uh, give uh, molecular aggregates and the molecular domains are uh, floated on water surface. And it was actually performed on this uh, uh, trough, water trough, and um, the mole molecules were spread on the water surface. And this sliding bar was moved to this uh, left direction and to reduce the uh, uh, monolayer surface area. And by you uh, by reducing the surface area and the mole uh, molecular molecular pressure was uh, measured by this uh, sensor. So you find that for the short shorter chain, a very smooth curve uh, appeared like this. But for the longer chain, a totally different results uh, uh, appeared, uh, having the linear part. The linear part is a representative for the uh, uh, strong molecular aggregates aggregates. And the bottom point of the linear part corresponds to the spontaneous molecular aggregation. So that's why these two surface area are beautifully uh, correlated by this uh, ratio two over root three uh, with an accuracy of three significant figures. So, and uh, the, uh, the SDA theory has been uh, uh, confirmed and, uh, quantitatively too. So uh, many of you may have some question uh, about the uh, definition of uh, chain lengths in the new SDA theory, because the, uh, uh, the terminal C3 is, is not included in the uh, chain lengths because, because of the uh, uh, theoretical convenience. But it, it has a very uh, good benefit. Uh, for example, uh, when we discuss the P4 and P4, uh, in the conventional uh, theory, uh, this conventional definition, uh, both compounds has is uh, both compounds are categorized into the C8 because it's it's octyl. But in uh, with with applying to the uh, new uh, SDA definition, uh, the P force uh, goes to M equals seven, uh, but P force is for M equals six. So uh, they are, uh, they can be discriminated from each other. And the, the another good point is that uh, according to the SDA theory, the M equals seven is for is uh, uh, for uh, self aggregation of the molecule, but M equals six, the molecule would act as a single molecule. 
So, and in fact, bioaccumulation factor of PFAS in fish is much larger than uh, that of uh, P4, uh, which is exp explained by the uh, self-aggregation property. So in this manner, the uh, new definition and SDA works uh, powerfully. And I'm showing you another interesting result for single molecular character of uh, PFAS. This is the picture of the PTFE tape, and the right panel shows the uh, stretched PTFE tape. This is a raw tape. This is this is a stretched PTFE tape, and uh, uh, water droplet is put on the surface, and uh, the size of the water droplet is fairly large in terms of the molecular size. So that's why the water droplet recognizes the macroscopic character of the tape surface. So that is why there is almost no change between the uh, unknown stretch and the stretch tape. But when we look at the surface um, in a molecular scale, the SDA packing is disaggregated by stretch. So the disaggregated, as a re result, a single molecular character is faced to the air. And that should attract the uh, molecular water, that is the vapor. So a very simple equation uh, experiments was performed. Uh, the road tape was put in the NMR tube and the NMR spectra was measured uh, in the presence of the molecular water, that is the vapor. So you see that the unstretched PTFE tape, the blue curve, it has no water peak, but the stretched PTFE tape showed a very clear uh, water absorption peak. And the peak width is fairly large, which implies that the molecular motion uh, on the PTFE tape is strictly prohibited because of the uh, strong uh, interaction between the uh, uh, water molecule and PTFE by the dipole-dipole interaction. So the point is that single molecular, uh, single molecular uh, profile anti chain is not hydrophobic. Hydrophobic property is for the macroscopic character. So the tape is when uh, the tape is heated up to 150 degree, uh, the water molecule still remains on the surface. Uh, so you uh, find that the, the molecular interaction between the water and the tape surface is, is fairly strong. And once again, I say that single profile chain is not hydrophobic. So I can summarize my talk today uh, that both in the conventional concept, both CF and CH were categorized into the uh, uh, hydrophobic ca uh, category, but it is not correct. And it is corrected by the SDA that CF and CH should be categorized into the orientation effect and the dispersion effect. But uh, uh, in terms of the orientation and the effect, that is the dipole-dipole interaction, uh, other uh, chemical groups than CF are also uh, involved in this category. So for example, CO double bond or CO single bond uh, are also involved in this category. So now this is the uh, uh, table for uh, the uh, use of the SDA theory. So what we, uh, we have to do when we encounter a new molecule is that uh, checking the chain length. For example, the peripheral RQ chain has uh, CF2, uh, the number of CF2 groups are counted and the number is seven or larger then the molecules are expected to give a bulk property. But uh, the chain is short the molecule would expect uh, to give a, a single molecular character. And in that case, the molecule should interact with the protein uh, very positively. So in that case, this table uh, should be referred. So the details are, are summarized in this uh, review paper that can be downloaded free of charge. So uh, please stop by this paper. So this is the last slide. Uh, thus far, uh, many people are concerned about the C8 molecules, uh, but uh, uh, unfortunately, a uh, very short molecular, short of molecular image was uh, available. So as a result, uh, total ablation was uh, discussed. 
But uh, good news is that SDA theory represents the paradigm shift, and we, we can uh, discuss the molecule or molecular interaction by looking at the chain lengths. And uh, so at, uh, at the moment, at least we can uh, discuss the bioaccumulation. And in the near future, toxicity should be uh, discussed by considering the uh, uh, reactivity, by considering the uh, dipole-dipole interaction between the PFAS and the proteins. And the SDA theory uh, uh, further uh, influences uh, not only the biophysicists, but for uh, industry and the chemists. For the industry, for, uh, uh, for development, the LC column, and for design for the collecting PFAS, aiming at the uh, zero emission and, and environmental cleanup. And the chemists are also excited to give a molecular design for recycling, uh, aiming at the dissembling molecules using a non-F solvent for process. So anyway, these efforts are all towards to the uh, sustainable goals of both environment and economy simultaneously. So that's all. So thank you very much for uh, listening to uh, my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dr. Hasegawa, for your presentation and uh, presenting this, this work. I think it does have uh, um, implications for um, yeah, new, new design of molecules, but uh, yeah, I see it very clearly how the different properties uh, would uh, change uh, different cleanup methods. So if you're targeting cleanup for different types of PFAS, uh, maybe this will need to be differentiated, the types of uh, approaches that are using based on, um, on their properties. With that, I'd like to thank very much both uh, Dr. Hasawaga and Dr. Wang today for providing us these uh, two presentations and uh, continuing our discussions on advancing the understanding of PFAS substances. Thank you very so, much. So thank you. Thank you so much.